When the AFL announced its team of the century in September 1996, no one was surprised that Carlton provided the fullback. Stephen Silvani got the nod, yet the football world was equally divided on whether Silvani or his predecessor at the Blues, Jeff Southby, should have won the role. Welcome, Jeff. Were you unlucky? Were you disappointed? Thanks, Mike. Nice to be here. But, uh, look, no, I wasn't really disappointed. Uh, it would have been lovely to have been selected uh, in, that, in that famous team. But uh, um, I had a great time, a hell of a lot of time for Stephen Silvani and his, uh, and his career as a footballer, magnificent footballer. Brilliant at full back as well as up forward at times too. So, but um, yeah, look, I was always taught to um, you know enjoy other people's success, mm -hmm. and I felt really good for him at the time. And uh, whilst a little disappointed that I didn't get it, but uh, I probably thought that um, David Dench might have got it. I think. Yeah. Well, I, 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 yeah. I share that same yeah. affection yeah. for Dench as you had. Yeah. Yeah. He was a brilliant player, wasn't he? Brilliant I mean, player, Dench. Yeah. Just yeah. that, and, and you played a little bit like him in terms of um, that purity of sort of see ball, go for ball. Yeah. And you both love running out of the back line. Yeah, I think we, we both had a bit of that boldness about us uh, to try and make the fullback position a bit more exciting than what it could be because uh, you could get locked up in, uh, in, in defence and be very negative all the time and punching away and, and that tends to eat you up a little bit after a while. So the, the, the positive stuff and uh, setting plays into attack and all that sort of thing is always, was always part of my armoury, I think, yeah. Interesting contrast with you and Silvani, although you both won two premierships <coughs> and you both won two BNFs. Yet he was more the physical player, mm. uh, concentrating on nullifying the opponent. You like to sort of just attack the footy and then take off. I'm amazed at how, how many times in, when I'm watching replays of your old stuff about how often you ran out of the back line bouncing the footy. Yeah, well, I, I, I sort of always felt that I wanted to do something on the attacking side. And in my early days, particularly when I, was, I had the speed to be able to, and particularly the initial speed to get away, uh, I could always get a bounce or two in and it all, always felt good. And, and if you could use the ball and kick it over the lines and that sort of thing and help get your team into attack, uh, it was always very, very helpful. But, but really my main focus was always on that uh, kicking, uh, always at stopping a full forward from kicking goals and, and, and the defensive side of it. And so there was always that, that was the, the main element of my, my game. But as I said, whenever I um, had a goal kicked on me, it was like having a knife in my back. It was, <laughs> What's uh, it I, really? oh, I used to just to hate having a goal yeah. kicked on me. It was, so it's that, that's, That's competitive competitiveness. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, it's more about yeah. the, you know, the hate to lose factor mm. rather than the absolute will to win factor. I reckon the hate to lose factor is the real key to a, a high quality uh, output in football, basically. Yeah. Geez, you played on some big names, didn't you? Yeah. Wade, McKenna, Beasley, Templeton. Yeah. Look, um, Doug Wade in my, Peter Hudson. My, in my first season. Peter Hudson, Doug Wade, Peter McKenna, fantastic footballers, magnificent full forwards, and their records all show that. Doug, and Doug Wade was made, uh, made me look silly at, at Princess Park very early in my career, kicked eight goals on me, and uh, that was a good lesson for me wow. that day. It was, uh, it was eight knives in my back. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I vowed declared I wasn't going to have another eight kicked on me, but uh, that didn't happen until uh, 1979 when Calvin Templeton kicked nine on me out at uh, Western Oval, and that was... Uh, that was a, a nasty day for me, and uh, and we got beaten quite convincingly that day. And Jezza was the Jezza was the coach, and uh, we all paid for it dearly uh, on the next Tuesday night with no footballs all running. So, um, mm. and of course, uh, my teammates at the time weren't all that happy with me having <laughs> letting Templeton <laughs> kick nine goals on me for the, for that day. But, so, uh, in yeah. the, when that <laughs> happened, you talked about Wade and, mm. and Templeton kicking bags. They left you at fullback, didn't they? You were the fullback, and you stayed there. Yeah, I think the the thinking at the time was that yeah, that they had enough faith in you to say, look, you can lift your game, and, uh, and particularly in the early seventies up until the late seventies, I think there were times that if you uh, lost your way a little bit towards the end of my career, back in the late seventies into the early eighties, then you'd, the coaches were then more uh, inclined to move you, and I spent a fair bit, a bit of time up the halfback flank, uh, not only, occasionally because I was being, uh, you know, maybe a wasn't going as well as I should have at full full back. A dream start for you. You come down from Bendigo, you win best and fairest in your first two years, play represent Victoria in your first year, and win a premiership in your second year. Yeah, look, uh, it's uh, it's yeah, it was a good start of my career. There's no doubt about that. And uh, and uh, it was probably a little bit uh, well, I got a bit ahead of myself, I think, because I was thinking after at the end of '72, or particularly after that grand final win, and how 
how we were all in the zone that day. It was just a magnificent day for Carlton when we beat the Tigers and kicked 28-9. Mm. And uh, I don't know whether that record will be um, knocked over <laughs> for a while. I'm certainly, I certainly won't for the way the footy's played these days. But, um, uh, but yeah, after that, at 72, after winning that premiership and being best and fairest for the second year in a row, um, my first two seasons... Uh, I was thinking this game's a bit too easy, or, or it's easy, you know, and thinking, oh yeah, and there'll be another premiership probably coming up, because that's what you play footy for, is the premiership thing and the team thing, and uh, and we battled away. There was a lot of wasted years, we believe, at Carlton at mm. that size, because we always had good teams, and, and we were in the finals most years up until 1979, it took till 79 until we had another one, and beating Collingwood in that... Uh, tough, hard game in 1979. Geoffrey, my memory is that you were selected to represent Victoria, I think, after about eight games in 1971. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, that my, my first season, that's right. Yeah. I, it was very early in the season, I know that, when the, when the first uh, uh, interstate game, the Big V, were playing over in the West, yeah. 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 Any other debutants with you? Well, yeah, it was. A, I think it was a pretty special uh, time because I... I believe that Keith Gregg and Peter Knights, I think, were also selected mm. in that same team and uh, all played all played their first games in 1971. So, uh, yeah, it was a pretty special time to have a few three youngsters in the team and, yeah. uh, and we went to Perth and uh, won the game. And uh, I think a highlight for me over there at the time was um, it was Polly Farmer's last game for, the, mm. for WA. He'd come back from Victoria, obviously, a few years earlier and... Uh, and uh, what an iconic footballer he yeah. was, and uh, to be able to play in the same game as uh, as Polly Farmer uh, it was a very special time. Jeff, I know it's reopening an old wound, but I want to take you back to Grand Final Day 1973 and that infamous clash between G Southby and N Balm. Let's uh, have a look at how Balmy saw it sitting in that chair two or three years ago. Now, in today's terminology, in the 73 Grand Final, you virtually assaulted Southby. Oh, very, very reckless. At, at in the nicest way you'd have, you could call it reckless. Yeah. I, no, I agree. I agree. But fortunately, I think Lee Matthews said it well once when he said, look, that was then, this is now. It's yep. very hard to in impose the standards of one day on another. I accept that. I just, the other and thing that, that's me making an apology. No, but I, it, yeah. sort of, it seems like I've talked to you about this briefly before in casual conversation. It's as if you sort of say, well, that was then. I'm not proud of it, but it doesn't haunt me. No, that's true. Yeah, it doesn't yep. haunt me. What did you think of that explanation, Jeff? Oh, look, I was, look, I've got a lot of time for Neil Baum, um, what he's done in football and particularly off the field. And um, look, at the time, I was incredibly disappointed that I get knocked out of a grand final like that. Uh, and obviously, you know, you'd have, you'd have something wrong if you weren't disappointed mm. about that because I know the doctor came out to me and said, um, you know, uh, what's your name? And I oh, said, give us a clue, I think I said. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think he said, no, I think you better come off, son. Um, so, and you know, I wasn't able to play again that, for that game and, uh, and it had a bit of an impact on me. On certainly for, uh, for the, I had concussion and uh, took a while for me to get my confidence back, I think, another year or so. And, uh, but Neil, Neil's, um, I mean, what he's done off the field, uh, I've got a lot, a lot of admiration for him. And, uh, and for me, um, time goes on and... Uh, and I've always been taught that you, you've got to move on with life. Mm. And have you crossed paths with Barmy to the yeah, point we have. you can we sit have. down and talk about that? We have. We haven't gone into real discussions, just more, more a bit of a chit-chat, mm. running into each other and in interviews where he's been on a panel and that, that side. So, but, you know, like, you know, he certainly mentioned there, there was, a, there was an apology there, so which was nice for me to hear and, and that sort of stuff. Has so. he apologised to you face-to-face? Uh, -face? No, not at this stage, not directly, but, mm. um, but it's... He's certainly getting the message through, I think, uh, through the media, I think, that sort of stuff. But it doesn't particularly worry me these days. I just move on with my life. And, mm. uh, but it worries uh, some of your teammates. Oh, though. yeah, yeah. Some I mean, of my teammates. Two family, of them family are still worried about it, all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but that's nice. That, you know, your teammates are concerned about things like that and, and your family and all that sort of stuff. But One of your good mates, David Mackay, was playing in that game. In The Age on the following Monday, he was quoted as saying that what he saw in the second quarter of the grand final, your incident, mm. made him sick. Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Powerful isn't it? stuff, yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a fairly nasty knock, I think, mm. when you look at it. But, but Swan was also hit pretty hard by Balm in, um, in 1972 grand final as well. Uh, that wasn't as documented as much as this one. But, mm. um, yeah, and had a broken jaw, but played out the game. Amazing effort by Swan. Played out the game with a broken jaw. And uh, 
So he's, uh, he wasn't a big fan of, uh, of Barmy after that, there's no doubt about that. And you can understand why he said those things at the, uh, after the 73 grand final. Yeah. Was your jaw cracked in that incident? No, no, I didn't. So you had no. a heavy bout of concussion? Heavy bout of concussion, yeah. so it didn't have any, any bone damage. Thing. Now, Ian Robinson was the umpire, grand final day 73. Yep. No free kick and no report. Mm. Have you ever crossed paths with Robbo? Yeah, well, actually, um, the first time I crossed paths with him after that grand final was probably a, a couple of weeks after, and I was just recovering from a fairly severe bout of um, concussion, and uh, we were at some function, I think, and he happened to be there, and he did make the effort to come up to me, and he said, look, uh, Jeff, he said, I've seen that, and he said, I really, I really should have reported Barmy for mm. that. And so that was sort of comforting for me at the time. There's a popular theory, Jeff, that that incident set you back for a considerable period. You, you'd won two best and fairest and had a very good year in 73. Mm. You didn't finish top three in the best and fairest at Carlton again until 1979. Yeah, yeah, I was in the top five or six, I think, the following year, but um, it was uh, a year that was a bit difficult. There was, I mean, your confidence gets knocked about a bit. Plus, I was also, at that stage, I'd just got married at the end of 1973. Life, my life was changing. Uh, I started a teaching career in early in 1974, so other factors coming into my life to have, that had a, uh, some sort of impact on probably my football. Uh, in my first couple of years, I was pretty much absolutely focused, and then it changes a little bit when your life changes like that. So that was another factor that could have um, caused a, uh, a little bit of drop in the form. But um, I loved the game, and uh, I was determined to get back to sort of the levels that I was playing in the first couple of years. And, mm. uh, I probably nearly got there, I think. Yeah. Well, you will assert, I, I thought 79, yeah. certainly in statistical terms, was probably as good as, you, as you'd had. Yeah, 79 was good. I had a very consistent year and uh, it was a great year and, uh, you know, we won a premiership. and there was You played every game? Played every game. Yeah. Fantastic players uh, in, the, in the team that year, you know, with Duel and, you know, Ashman and Mackay and, you know, Mc, McClure. We had you know, a great, uh, great team going on in 79 and... Uh, and we were very focused with and fit with Jezza uh, as the coach. <laughs> I want to ask you about the Jezza regime. Yeah. The simple view from the outside is that every time you had a poor performance, not you, the team, yep. that uh, Jezza said, well, you'll pay for it on the training track on Monday or Tuesday. Yes. Uh, yeah, he, he, we were scared to lose really a bit. Jezza had, that, had instilled that into us. He, he, he had this situation where um, if you lost, um, we then, uh, the training session on the Monday was an uh, incredibly severe amount of running, basically. And, uh, but we were very fit and we came into the finals um, because we had, we still loved Jezza because of he was Jezza and he was our mate, that sort of thing. He had to change and we, a lot of us understood that he had to, had to come up with some sort of a technique mm. to, to have the difference between him as the the teammate and him as the coach and I think he he did that really well and um, hence we uh, ended up playing some pretty good football and we were tough enough and fit enough and probably talented enough to win that premiership in a, in a real tough game against Collingwood in 79. You, were, you lost two games that year didn't you? Yeah not too many. Mm. Hey. Was yeah. that the best team you played in with the Blues? Oh look I would have thought 72 was nearly as yeah. good. We had yeah. a great year in 72 uh, even though Richmond was giving us a hard time for most of that year. Uh, we did knock them over in the big one. And, uh, but yeah, 72, 79 were very, very good. And then 81, 82 were pretty good too with the, with the influx of the youngsters. And, Interesting. You, you, and the larrikans and all those. Yes, the larrikans and the legends. <laughs> the subject of a recent book by Dan Eddy, which is a very good book actually. Yeah, good book. Yeah. You missed both of those premierships in uh, 81, 82. 81, 82, yeah. How uh, deeply does that burn? It hurts. No one... Ha you, it, Nothing worse than an injured footballer when you can't play, you know, and I was probably good enough to be in that in the, both of those grand final sides. I was on vice captain of the team one of those years, I think, and played for most of the year. Um, 81, I did do my back early in the year, and it took me a while to get back into it. I had a pretty severe back injury, and but I got back in and played um, most of the last uh, second half of the season, albeit with a back brace and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff, but I was getting myself around reasonably well, and... Uh, uh, but I had at the last session of training before the grand final, I uh, ripped my groin. It was sort of back related mm. and ripped my groin and uh, it was right towards the end of that session and I had to go and then uh, 
well, I was thinking to myself, will I, will I tell the coach, will I tell, uh, <laughs> you know, this is not good, and I'm thinking, will I be okay, you know, and I, but I, I said, well, I have to think about what's going on here, you know, it's not, not you as a, a team thing, all those mm. sort of things, so I finally made the, uh, came clean and said, look, I've done my groin, I, and uh, they said, well, we better do a, um, a fitness test the next morning prior to the game, and, uh, and I failed that fitness test, and, uh, uh, the following year I was motoring along reasonably well and uh, I think it was this, one of the qualifying finals that I twanged a hamstring. So mm. you twang a hamstring, it's got to be about four weeks. This was, it was only two weeks before the grand final. Yeah. So, so that was the story of uh, not being able to play in two grand finals. It's painful. I bet it is because, I mean, the blokes that your mates, like yeah. Yeah. Um, Jones, uh, Johnson, Swanee Mackay, Mackay yeah, we'll play four, yeah. four flags, yeah. all of them. Yep. Yeah, I played it two, so I was so lucky to play in the two. So that's what that's the way I look at it. And and well, I played in two, and then only lasted half in the '73 one, which we lost. And uh, then um, two with injury, and you, you celebrate with the boys, but it's not the same. No, it's not the same. When you were in the latter stages of your career, the view from in the media circle certainly was that Carlton was saying you were having either back injuries or hamstring injuries, mm. and they were a cover for depression. Mm. Is that true? Very much so, yeah. Yeah, look, I, um, I suppose the first event, that, well, the first bout of severe depression I had was uh, at the end of 1979. We played in this, won a premiership, 79, magnificent, you know, feeling to be able to win a premiership. I was only able to celebrate the, the night after that premiership. The next day and, and, the, and the following three, Two or three months, I felt I went into deep depression and uh, severe depression, and uh, and I had to go through lots of lots of treatment, and uh, finally got myself back on track after taking some medication and getting a lot of counselling and being with psychiatrists and all that sort of stuff. But it was all at the time when it was all hush hush, and at this stage it was all kept very much under the closet and or in the closet and. And uh, it was part of that stigma of depression at the time, and it wasn't much fun, I can tell you, because you were sort of living a bit of a life of mm. sort of, oh, well, yeah, and everyone's saying, how's the back, or how are you feeling? Yeah, and I said, yeah. so not too many really knew. But I managed to get myself back on track and, and probably missed about five or six games the next year in 1980, and then uh, had a very good year, actually. I think I ended up second in the best and fairest and ended up playing for Victoria. And so I got myself back on track really well and was feeling, you know, really good about myself. My self-esteem had come back, all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. But then uh, the following two years I was up and down, 82, you know, 80, uh, 81, 82, um, you know, I was struggling a bit, 83, I, I had a couple of pretty severe bouts that, during the season but I hung in there sort of thing and then and then uh, in the 84 season um, I started off the season in pretty good shape. Uh, pretty good mentally at the stage but all of a sudden I had this crash and I fell into deep depression again and uh, ended up in, in the Melbourne clinic for, for seven days and I know at the time the media weren't, uh, you know, it was hush hush, mm. it's, it's an ugly time of my life when I think back because it's bad enough being, in, being depressed but, uh, and you don't really want to talk about it yourself but mm. it wasn't out there, you know, that sort of stuff but, um, but it was an ugly time and, uh, and that those seven days that I had in the um, Melbourne clinic was an incredible experience, uh, something that you'd never like to go through again. Um, I spent the next, after I retired, I spent the next 10 years or so up and down a bit, but still coping with life reasonably. Then I had a pretty good time for the next 10 years until my late 40s, and then I had this huge crash again and ended up having four weeks in the Melbourne clinic. Uh, and I wasn't sure whether I was ever going to get out of there. That's the, mm. That was the state that I was in. Uh, thank God uh, that you know, I had a great support from all my friends and particularly my family, my wife and Lorraine and family and all that sort of stuff, but managed to hang in there and then medication sort of kicked in and all of a sudden I recovered pretty well and quite, quite well and I haven't touched wood. I haven't been, I've been very good since pretty much. Yeah. Was the depression set off by an event or do you think it was genetic? Oh, there's, a, there's a bit of genetic in it. My dad had depression so I think there certainly is. My brother, one of my eldest brothers got bipolar uh, who suffers and my, one of my eldest sisters suffers from depression. Some of, my, some of my cousins and relatives in the next generation are suffering a bit so there's a genetic connection and um, I reckon in 1979 what triggered it, I, I think I was, uh, I was teaching 
high school HSC, teaching physics and maths and stuff like that. That would depress me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I said, I was only, only about three weeks in front of those kids, I reckon, <laughs> with physics. Uh, physics was always a challenge for me, but I was teaching it anyway. And, uh, and uh, that was a big year just as, as a teacher. And then we had this incredibly t difficult year with Jezza as the coach who really ran us. And we trained extremely hard that year, the hardest we've ever trained, or the hardest I've ever mm. trained. And uh, I reckon by the time I, the, the 79 membership was over, I was just mentally and physically stuffed. So, uh, and that sort of triggered the press. And it was a long road back, because it, maybe it's a long road up into that mm. state throughout your career, because the pressure of footy is there, always there. And uh, I admire the fact that mm. you're prepared to talk about it, but that's a quick change, isn't it? I mean, we were the, the industry mm. used to sort of push it aside oh, yeah, yeah. and not talk about it when you were playing. Yeah, well, it was the, not only the industry, it was just right across the board, basically. And I think you've got to give great credit to you know, someone like uh, Jeff Kennett for his initiative in, with Beyond Blue and, and the other similar initiatives that happen interstate with you know the Black Dog Institute and all mm. those sort of things. Mm. So it's incredible now that you can able to come out and be confident and feel comfortable about talking about it and I find it quite therapeutic to actually talk about it. Mm. Uh, it's good for me when I do that sort of thing. So. When you were in the grip of it, when you were playing, mm. how did it manifest itself? I mean, well, it's, uh, you, your mind can't work for a start, so your decision making is, and, and you're, you're numb to um, emotions, all those sorts of things, so it's a horrible, particularly if you're in severe depression and there were times that, it, you know, where I wanted to go off and, you know, do all that, all that sort of stuff, so. Really? Oh, yeah, it got to that stage, so it was pretty. You were talking to me, with that gesture I'd take it mean you were, yeah, you were suicidal? Yeah, suicidal, yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, so not much fun when that happens, I can tell you, and it's, uh, it's a nasty thing. I know in the end of 84, when, uh, when I'd, after I'd been in hospital, I'd wanted to try and get myself back and play a bit of footy, I thought that might be good for me. And I know that my last seven or eight, I didn't play in the seniors, I played in the twos. And it was like getting up and climbing Mount Everest every mm. Saturday to just to continue on trying yeah. to play a game of footy. And uh, by the end of that, I said, well, I think I've given it my best shot and uh, time to move on and retire, basically. That was the end of 84. Yeah. Were you able to confide in people at the footy club? Only uh, my closest mates, probably, and uh, and the doctors, obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, the coach, basically. So, yeah, they so were very Mark good. The Carlton, Carlton handled it as well as and as professionally as they could have at the time. Uh, there was no doubt about that. But would you have been better off if it had been a public issue and probably. people were aware? Very much so, I think, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is happening today. Correct. Think, yeah, yeah. yeah, and when you see, when you, when you see things like uh, Alex Fasolo and yeah. Travis Cloak and others, yeah. Clearly you'd empathise oh, with yeah, them. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can empathise with them. And it's good that they've been able to sort of maybe nip it into the bud a little bit this way, whereas mine sort of just dragged on and you didn't really want to, you know, expose your, you know, the, the problem you had and mm. all those sorts of things because of the stigma around it all. Yeah. Geoffrey, at one point in your career, I think mid-70s, you wanted to go to South Melbourne, correct? Yep, that's right. Yep. Why so? Why so? I was approached by South Melbourne at the time. I was sort of, I'd played about 120 games or something with Carlton at the time and... Uh, I'd played at the one position, full back. You know, it's only natural at times that you're, you're looking for a bit of a change. And, uh, and at that stage, uh, I think it was... Um, Ian Stewart was coaching, mm -hmm. and, I, uh, and I think... Uh, I used to have a few chats with Stewie after the game when we were playing against him, you know, down at the Lakeside Oval and having a beer after the game, that sort of stuff. And, and, uh, and I think out of those chats, uh, Stewie sort of organised for some an approach basically to me and I thought well you know, let's let's explore this and uh, and I decided that uh, I would like to have a change so I uh, so I what happened is that they went to Carlton and wanted to, wanted to clear me but in those days Carlton said no and and you and there was a situation where you could threaten legal action mm. and all that sort of stuff, which we went down that path. Um, I wanted to move genuinely at the time. I wanted to... Why, though? Why, why would you leave a powerhouse club like that uh, to go to the south? Oh yeah, I needed a change, basically. That was, that was the reason. Change of environment. Uh, change of environment. Like, you know, I'm a, I do recruitment in, um, in my business world and, uh, you know, people want to change uh, every now mm. and then. And that's, mm. that, that's, that at the time hit me. And, uh, and of course, they, they've come to me and made a bit of a, uh, a lure for me to go. And, um, and so I made the effort. Um, it, and it was tough, tough at the time. I think I stood out for about, I stood out for about six or eight games. 
and uh, the Swans couldn't do anything with Carlton in terms of organising me a, cl a clearance. And at the same time, I made sure I didn't burn any bridges with, mm. with, with Carlton. I mean, I still loved the place because it was giving me so much in those first five or six years. But uh, and then I made a decision that they wanted they, well, they wanted me back, so I made a decision I'd go back and eat a bit of humble pie and uh, played a couple of games in the twos, and then got back in the seniors. They made you play in the seconds. Yeah, made me yeah. Play, yeah. And how'd you cope with that? I was okay, yeah. yeah. It was my first game in the seconds, I yeah, think, yeah. yeah. First games in the seconds, so... Um, but, yeah, I could understand it, and, uh, you know, and, uh, but I got myself back pretty quickly and played some pretty solid footy mm. after that for a number of years, and, uh, and my love of Carlton continued to grow after mm. that. I mentioned before Larrikins and Legends, and it's an yeah. amazing revelation. I mean, you blokes were so open to Dan Eddy. Mm. Uh, lots of big names through that book. I mean, some of the, so many great names that have played for Carlton. Who was the best player you played with? Look, uh, yeah, look, there were some magnificent players. I mean, Jezelanko was absolutely sensational. Um, you had uh, the likes of Sid Jackson, the, the excitement machines, and then you had Big John Nichols, who was just mm. a, a colossus of a footballer and a, just a brilliant, brilliant coaching performance in, in 1972. And then you've got the likes of Bruce Duell. I mean, hmm. the Mr. Consistency and Mr. Brilliance at the same time. Sort you blokes revered Bruce Duell. Oh, didn't Bruce, you? yeah. Look, he was just one of those guys that he was. Look, he trained. He never, never missed training. He just turned up everywhere and he was just so reliable. And, and his ability out on the field to uh, his reflexes and his ability to sort of to turn defence into attack and all those sorts of things was just very special over an incredible long time and how lucky was I? I played 250 games behind Bruce mm. basically and Bruce was in front of me so made my, my life a bit easier up did, the back. Did, the, 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 the view of Dooley is that he never opened his mouth, only to eat, that was the only time he opened his mouth. Did you, did you have a, uh, any, uh, conversations with him regularly? We, Yes, but he was very introverted. He's, he's, he's still introverted. He was always very quiet. One of the most introverted footballers or persons that I've ever met. But incredibly genuine. And when you had a chat with him, it was all very, very meaningful. Now, next time you're having lunch with Dooley, yeah. will you tell him how enjoyable this is and that I'd love to have him in that seat? <laughs> if there's two blokes I could get, they'd be Plugger and Bruce Dool. Yeah. Uh, good luck. Good <laughs> luck with that. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, Jeff, you're a star as a player, and I can say this honestly, you're always a gentleman in the entire 14 years that you played uh, at, the, at the level. Uh, I love watching you play, beautiful footballer, and uh, I think you probably could have won three or four premierships, but you've got the two and no one can take those off you. Great to see you. Thanks very much, Mike. Pre appreciate it. This has been a production of Fox Sports.